what do they think about not just what's happening in their own environments, you know, what, what do they think or even also know about some of the consumption problems that we as humanity are causing around the world and what do they say about that? Right. So those those societies only take what they need for for their communities. And so it's very diff- a di- very different model than than we have which is like stockpiling commodities and a lot of waste. You know, so we're we we're we're in a model that they don't you know they don't relate to. It's uh it's a different situation in every country, right? Because the the way that uh, that indigenous people have exist in in societies is, is different. Their relationship in Canada is is very different from uh, indigenous leadership, for example, in the Congo, where people, you know, local people, indigenous people are are one and the same. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's it's a and it's it's a different story. And like for example, in North America. Um, in U in the U S and Canada, there's specific uh, indigenous first nations as as, yes. or it, as we call it in Canada territories, um, and that's that's sort of that's sort of different even by province. Like for example, in British Columbia, they never ceded their land, and so there's a different there's a different they never what they never ceded their land. They ne- there was never a fight. There was never a uh, a moment oh, where seated. right yeah so there's a there's a different relationship than in the east where there there were when clo- when the colonization happened there there was a different sort of dynamic between the colonizers and the indigenous people there so there's a different there's there's different levels of disruption to mm. indigenous societies in, in different parts of the country where where in the east there's more they're more a part of uh, regular society, and there's more intact indigenous communities in the in the West, uh, mm. in, in terms of functioning as a nation, and they have therefore p- potentially more pre- more preserved traditional knowledge, and that's also the case in places like the Amazon or in or in the or in DRC or in Indonesia, where traditional knowledge can still be learned from because there's more of it left intact. Uh, and there's different levels of respect for indigenous people in different countries. You know, the relationship here is, is, is difficult, uh, in, in the United States where, you know, where the history is, is not great Yeah. and, and it isn't great in Canada either. So I think it's, it's, it's a moment where we need to learn from them more than ever. Uh, and that's like, there's so much to be learned from in that journey that we have to take back to a place of harmony with nature. Yeah. I I had heard a a quote that I've cited on different podcasts that's a little bit out of context, but I'm going to bring it into context here. It was from the show Homeland. I don't know if you ever watched that, Mm -hmm. but show about some lady in the CIA constantly fighting, you know, wars and terror. But there was a really nasty terrorist in the show who did happen to make a fairly good quote that that made sense when he was talking to one of the CIA guys who he had captive about, you know, their differences. And he said, America hates what it can't understand. Sure. And I'm gonna I'm gonna edit that quote and make it more general and say like society not even necessarily hates, but doesn't care about or acknowledge what mm-hmm. it can't understand. Yeah. And I'll be the first to tell you, I can't understand what it's like to live off the land as mm-hmm. an indigenous person whose family was on this same land 2,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. No. I don't understand that. But what I'd like to think I have is some empathy for that. And the fact that, you know, perhaps maybe the answer isn't having multinational corporations come in and <laughs> ruin mm-hmm. the land that's already in some cases been taken from them. But I, I think a lot of, a lot of people kind of comes back to the capitalism thing we were talking about there. That isn't really a thought. The thought is, okay, we see resource, resource mean money, money mean good. Let's go get. Yeah. And, and they're, they're in something that's much more circular or that's what yes. the tra- traditional uh, way was, was to have this circular relationship with, with, uh, with, with nature. And we are, sort of like more export extract. Yes. And that's why progress with with working with 
these indigenous indigenous nations when we're doing conservation progress happens at the speed of trust mm. because they don't trust the way we go about things and so when we come in and say we want to help you know they don't know who age of union is they don't know they don't they don't trust the west the western sure. philosophy so they're like okay well so how do they know our intentions are really aligned with theirs? So it's it's a slow process. Sometimes for us, where we're so scheduled, especially me with, with startup DNA, you know, that's it's and that's what I've tried to do with Age of Union is infuse it with startup DNA, which means a fast pace, which is operating at the uh, for me it's progress um, at the pace of urgency, mm. and and because we want to ally so. so because we want to ally for all for what we believe are the right reasons with with local indigenous local ind indigenous people to create meaningful change on the ground we have to respect that for them progress moves at the speed of trust because we don't have trust nobody do nobody does have trust because of what's happened well you were talking to, this just reminds me you were telling me something off camera i think when we were in the car today about how captain paul watson's expertise before doing any of this was communications mm -hmm. and how he's talked about how that's the most critical thing to getting the word out and stuff like that. But, you know, and feel free to expand upon that as well in, in answering your question here. But it, it, it does, it does make me <coughs> wonder from the outside, you know, how much of this does come back to the most simple human things. In this case, communication, understanding, having an ability to go back and forth. Maybe you don't have the same idea for everything, but how do you reach that common ground? It seems to me like that's what, that's essentially at the core of what AG Union does. Cause when, as you were just explaining, when you go into these places, you have to understand where they're coming from and, and show them why you can make sense for them. So people ask me, what's the, what's the first, what's the most important thing uh, that you need to, Exemplify and the, the the thing you need to prioritize the most when you're a leader, and I tell them the, that the first thing for me is listening, mm -hmm. and that's almost the opposite of what people think that they want that that uh, what uh, what a leader should do. A leader should be somebody that's saying a lot. A leader should be somebody that's uh, that's projecting some type A, alpha sort of you know, energy. A real a real real leadership, and that's what we that's the stance we take when we are engaging in places we don't understand anything about is listening. You know, to go to to the eight pro, eight of the ten projects is to go listen, go listen to the local people, the indigenous people, folks like like Paul who are allies of those people, is to listen and to and to understand, and that's how you build trust. It's not by talking a lot, uh, and then and then incorporating what you've heard uh, into. The plan that everybody's going to come up with and that you can support and hearing their plan they understand the situation like i said the social political economic reality of an area that's so specific can be so specific for even that part uh of the of, of the area and that's that is how i think you build the trust and how you build the long-term solutions that that people buy into 100 percent, man i had brian mcmonicle in here last year he is one of the best defense attorneys in the country. He represented Bill Cosby. Don't hold that against him. When you operate at the level that those people operate, failure is not an option. Losing is not an option. Is, I think, the greatest evidence of man's inhumanity to man. But remember this. Jurors were being asked to make a decision about whether he did it. And that case was, at least the way we tried it, the time we tried it, I thought a very defensible case on the facts. Is, you know, you want to kind of bring jurors to their best and make them realize that in a few short moments when the case is given to them, they're all that stands between him and a conviction for a crime he didn't commit, is the argument. The jury of 12 people there, they know this is Bill Cosby in that room. They know Bill Cosby don't have a public defender. Yeah. Like you're a subtle guy, you're not like a flashy dresser, but they know that suit probably doesn't cost two dollars, and it's not from Joseph A. Bank. That's right. You get up there though, and you look this jury in the eyes as Bill Cosby's attorney, and you said something to the effect of, and actually quit after he got him off, and then Cosby got found guilty after. But he also represented Meek Mill mm -hmm. and got him out of that situation in Philly, which was really bad. But you know he was brought on by Michael Rubin and Jay Z, mm -hmm. and I remember talking with him about you know some of these guys he works with, and he was raving 
about Jay Z and what a what a genius that guy is and and how incredible he is, you know, leading his various businesses. Mm -hmm. And when I asked him about that, your answer just reminded me of this. But when I asked him what separates him, he says, when you go into a meeting with that guy, he don't talk. Mm. But he's listening to every single thing that's said and processing it. He mm -hmm. doesn't say many words even at the end. And then he makes decisions based on all the evidence that he's been presented. And I think he literally said, like, that's what makes him such a great leader. And it's so true because I think – you know, you do have to be, you got to be able to talk to, yeah. you, you got to be able to, to get your points across. To, Synthesize what you've learned. Yes. But everybody that's been in the room with you should feel that you, yes. that they were heard. Exactly. You don't have to, you don't have to come up with, if you're the leader and you have to make the decision, you don't have to make a decision that makes everybody happy. But if everybody feels heard, whether it's a company or it's, it's a situation on the ground with conservation, if people can, you can, you give an opportunity for people to follow you when when they when they feel when they know that they've been heard and that you've listened and it's 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 so funny that that the people that are perceived as the strongest leaders are not the people that are you know going off and uh, and and filling the airwave uh, of a meeting with their own voice it's the one, and obviously in this case scenario we're supposed to be talking so we're like we're we're talking a lot but i mean in in a meeting where you're where you're trying to bring people together and you're trying to create solutions and be the leader that's that's it's so interesting that it's the not the non-talking that actually projects that that respect thank you for watching the video guys please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below